uh, Pier Carlo Paduan, and in many ways, uh, Pier Carlo is the ideal speaker for this place, the ideal keynote speaker. Why do I say this? So, this is a place where uh, the idea is that academics, uh, government officials, and politicians meet. Uh, now, Pier Carlo is all three things in one person. The last time we met was in 2014 when Pier Carlo was chief economist of the OECD, so, uh, if you like, an expert in an international. Uh, organization, and in his previous life, uh, he was a professor of economics, but at some point, Pierre Carli, you, you decided to leave the Arcadia of academia and, uh, so to speak, you know, step into the real world, and uh, first became an advisor. Uh, you had various high-ranking positions in and out of Italy, uh, and then uh, you decided to get, get into politics, really, and become the finance minister of Italy uh, during a time where Italy uh, spent considerable efforts to stabilize its finances, to go into to reform and come up with consolidation. Uh, and now you're still a member of parliament, uh, but you're facing the new position here uh, in Italy and in Europe. And you told me today you will primarily speak about the EU, not about Italy, but uh, I'm sure you know Italy will also play a role. Um, and uh, people will be interested, very interested in hearing your views. So welcome again, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, everybody, and thanks very much for this invitation, which is most welcome. Uh, yes, I am afraid I will disappoint you by addressing mostly uh, European problems, but of course, inevitably, my approach will be Italian-based, so you will, you, you will probably feel a little flavor of Italy in what I say about Europe. And I promise I'll try to cut short my presentation so that there's more space for questions about Italy, which I will be happy to take. So the uh, title of this conference is about reshaping Europe. And there are many ways one can address this uh, multidimensional topic. Let me say that I would like to choose the following starting from recognizing that over the more recent past, Europe has become, for an increasing number of EU citizens, part of the problem, after being for a long time part of the solution. This is reflected in the surveys about citizens' trust in EU institutions, and more importantly, in election outcomes in several member states. What is often referred to as populism, indeed, in my view, can also be referred to as anti-Europeanism. For those of us who believe in the European project, this is shocking. Yet it is imperative that we recognize that Europe is indeed becoming part of the problem. Conversely, for those who do not share a pro-EU approach, the solution should be outside the European project, and eventually in terms of a sovereign state approach which implies confrontation rather than cooperation among member states. This, in a nutshell, is, in my view, the policy dilemma we are facing today. Since its inception, the European project has been driven by the idea that more integration would bring more growth, more jobs, more welfare, and more security. This formula has worked for a long time. Europe has succeeded in setting up a social protection system unparalleled in the world. It has prevented wars and produced decades of peaceful cooperation and welfare. This is no longer the case. Presently, while growth is resuming, unemployment remains elevated at least in some, if not in several, EU member states. Growth may come back, but, and this is a key point in my view in analysis of the current situation, is not inclusive and it leaves behind large segments of the population. New technologies are an important source of productivity growth, but also a cause of job destruction. Welfare systems are becoming increasingly expensive due to aging populations and unable to secure adequate protection in a context of fast-changing labor conditions. Migration is putting under pressure the control of EU borders and, more importantly, is increasingly perceived as a threat to domestic security. These symptoms of distress of the European construction have one element in common. The difficulty in identifying convincing and effective European responses, and I underline the convincing, and the rise of national responses instead 
national responses that imply less, not more integration, national responses that exacerbate the contrast between, on the one hand, traditional political parties, both popular and social democrats, to recall the major European political families, all in different ways pro-Europe, and new populist parties and organizations, also in different ways anti-Europe. In addition to the new domestic divides, the emergence of highly vocal sovereign political programs exacerbate areas of disagreement between countries, high debt versus low debt countries, high growth versus low growth countries, countries hosting significant migration inflows versus countries opposing them, net payers versus net receivers. The picture is not new. What is new is that contrary to the past, the quote unquote more integration approach is not able to overcome national differences and preferences and provide consensus over collective and shared solution. National preferences have always existed and always will, reflecting healthy national diversities and cultures. The challenge is not to cast aside such differences, but to develop a common European culture that can flourish alongside national cultures and support solutions that include both European and national components. So I'd like to offer a few examples of how the challenge is developing on some of the key issues of the European agenda. Let me start with banking union. Maybe it's, this is an obvious starting point. Banking union is one of the most ambitious projects in history of European integration. Member states agree that banking union is necessary to strengthen the economic and monetary union. However, progress towards the completion of banking union, including its third pillar, a common deposit guarantee scheme, has been uneven and increasingly difficult. It is a good example of the interaction, and in some cases of the conflict, between the national and the European dimension in the process of integration. It has taken a specific form and language, the relationship between risk reduction and risk sharing. Risk reduction is about dealing with national sources of risk, such as a high debt, both public and private, and or excessive accumulation of non-performing loans and other risky assets. Risk sharing is about recognizing that risks are also system related and require system level, EU level responses, such as a common deposit insurance scheme or a common backstop to a single resolution fund. So much progress has been achieved in addressing risk reduction, much less has been achieved in terms of risk sharing. The debate has been characterized by a clear divide a group of countries has been repeatedly asking for sufficient risk reduction to be implemented by high-risk countries. Another group of countries has been requesting parallel progress in risk reduction and in risk sharing, arguing that the two elements would mutually, mutually support each other. EU member states have recently adopted additional risk reduction measures, while decisions about risk sharing measures, including the backstop, have been postponed. Another example is the stabilization function. To perform effectively, a monetary union needs stabilization mechanism, both at the national level and at the union level. National level instruments include the building up of fiscal buffers, most notably in good times, that can be used in bad times and help prevent negative shocks having excessively adverse impacts on the economy. In addition, Debt dynamics should be put on a downward path at a reasonable pace, meaning that the decline of debt should be maximized while avoiding exerting an excessive break on demand. This requires maintaining a high nominal growth rate, a sustained primary surplus, and a low risk perception reflected in the interest rate. Allow me to quote Italy's narrow path policy as implemented over the past legislature, which could be seen as an example of an effective approach. So much for the national dimension. What about the European dimension? Absent the exchange rate, experience shows that negative shocks can hit monetary union members significantly through labor markets as well as investment activities. Negative shocks can lead to over-adjustment in both areas, employment and capital accumulation, 
and lead to undesirable impacts on potential growth through hysteresis, with negative consequences for monetary union as a whole. Therefore, there is a strong case for stabilization mechanisms to deal with rainy day situations. The objections, of course, to such mechanisms is well known. It has been quoted in previous, by previous speakers. They could lead to possibly a permanent transfer union, that, thus exacerbating national divergence rather than promoting convergence, while possibly activating opportunistic behavior. However, stabilization mechanisms, such as, for instance, cyclical unemployment insurance schemes can be designed in ways that avoid permanent transfers while being effective in smoothing shocks. Such mechanisms could well complement national stabilizer schemes while providing other benefits, such as supporting the introduction of labor market reforms, as they could mitigate the short-term negative impacts of such reforms. A similar case can be made for investment stabilization tools with respect to public investment, which tends to be reduced in times of fiscal consolidation. In the case of public investment, the scope for better coordinating national and European instruments is particularly relevant. I can mention two aspects. While a European stabilization tool could fill fill the gaps in resources available for public investment, it is the responsibility of national policies to improve and streamline public administration and red tape impediments to public investment, as well as removing other structural impediments to investment. Secondly, EU finance public investment in infrastructure, material and immaterial, can act as a powerful multiplier for private investment. The stabilization function, of course, requires instruments and resources. One option is to introduce a dedicated budget line in the EU budget. Although the amount currently envisaged in the proposal on the table may be little more than symbolic, symbols are important and can contribute to building a common EU approach. Another element that goes in, the, in this direction is the consideration of EU common goods that Otmar Ettinger, Ettinger d d d described at length previously, such as security, management of common borders, competitiveness and innovation, and cohesion. Resource allocation within the EU budget should prioritize such common goods, reflecting the rapidly evolving challenges facing Europe as a whole that require EU in addition to national responses. Another example is a strategy for growth and jobs that clearly calls, in my view, for a dual national European strategy. Boosting growth requires structural measures at both levels. Potential growth has been declining, especially since the outbreak of the financial crisis and throughout the European Union, although at different rates in different countries. Convergence among countries and regions has reversed following the crisis. The decline in productivity growth has been particularly severe in the total factor productivity component, signaling poor performance in innovation-related activities. Improving productivity growth among regions and countries requires establishing the conditions for the introduction and diffusion of new technologies, both digital and related to other innovation-driven activities. This, in turn, requires reforms at the national level to facilitate investment in material and immaterial capital, improve the business environment, support innovation diffusion, and catching up between advanced and lagging regions and companies. We know, however, that the benefits of reforms usually materialize with the lag with respect to implementation costs, which are felt at the outset of the reform process. This can lead to hesitation in the implementation of reform or fatigue in keeping the pace of reforms healthy and lively. Evidence also shows that benefits of reforms are larger when implemented in the upswing of the cycle, as a growing economy helps mitigate adjustment costs. These facts suggest that there is a scope for establishing a link between structural reforms and flexibility in the design of the fiscal adjustment path. Last but not least, in an integrated economy such as the EU, reforms in one country, especially if large, can produce positive spillovers in neighboring countries, 
for instance, because of stronger growth. Finally, to the extent that structural reforms increase resilience and flexibility in countries where they are introduced, they facilitate, for instance, the transmission of monetary policy measures while ma minimizing the possible different impacts of the monetary policy stance. In short, there are good reasons from a EU, EU perspective to boost structural reforms at the national level. National reforms efforts are necessary in all countries. No single country can be said to be immune from impediments to investment that require reforms. However, there is also need to strengthen the European dimension in, of the structural agenda. In short, revitalize the single market and its main components, digital, service, financial, as well as strengthening investment in human capital. A healthy and dynamic single market is needed for the same reasons that were behind its launch decades ago, to exploit scale and scope economies, to boost competition, to eliminate barriers to factor mobility, to provide a large market today for digital infrastructure investment. Indeed, the digital revolution makes the case for a strong single market even more compelling. Boosting the digital economy as a source of growth implies taking into account the employment consequences, which may be significant in terms of job destruction, while not necessarily generating new jobs in amounts and quality sufficient to replace what has been lost. Finally, Europe needs more growth, but growth must be inclusive. If, also as a consequence of digitalization, growth increases inequalities, consensus for reforms and for the European project will decrease, possibly vanish, and national solutions will most likely prevail, leading to more barriers, less integration, and ultimately less growth in a self-defeating vicious circle. Let me add that inclusion-enhancing policies go beyond traditional regional cohesion. They also deal with issues such as intergenerational and income disparities. Above all, they deal with equal opportunities in addition to more equal income and wealth distribution. The four cases I have discussed suggest that performance in Europe can be improved if action at both the national and the EU level is implemented. Purely national solutions would underperform and in some cases generate economic and social dynamics pointing in the directions of increasing fragmentation and increasing disintegration. Multilevel solutions are the more needed today as new global challenges are facing Europe and the world. Again, these were mentioned by previous speakers. Trade tensions, large migration pressures, incredibly fast technological change impacting on everyday lifestyles possible instability arising from financial innovation. It is difficult to believe that national responses alone can lead to sustainable solutions. But if multilateral solutions deliver better results, why are we witnessing a growing support to national or sovereign solutions instead? The short answer, at least my short answer, is that multilevel, as opposed to purely national solutions, require collective rather than individual approaches. And this, in turn, requires trust. And in Europe, trust is in short supply. Trust of citizens in European institutions. Trust within member states about other member states. Trust of citizens in political elites. Trust takes a long time and hard effort to accumulate. It takes short little time to be destroyed. Trust is accumulated through behavior. Respecting and implementing commonly agreed rules is a basic ingredient to build trust. Only once trust has reached a reasonable level, it is possible to reconsider existing rules. Trust accumulation must work both ways. All parties involved must be behave by the rules and be open to changing the rules if there is a consensus to do so. As trust fades away, the temptation to ignore rules becomes stronger. Nationalism prevails and trust further weakens. Such a situation can get out of control and become the driver of nationalistic attitudes which become hard to eradicate. This, unless the EU approach, which implies more risk sharing and collective solutions, 
better integrated national policies, prevails the EU approach and bears results that can be clearly perceived and appreciated by European citizens. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Piercarlo. Are there comments uh, or, or questions in the back, please? If you'll briefly introduce yourself, please. Yeah, Herbert Dieter, German Institute for International Security Affairs. Uh, your question or your assumption is that uh, by establishing trust, citizens of Europe will arrive at the same kind of preferences. Um, that may be the case, but it may also not be the case. It may be possible that European citizens continue to have diverging preferences. And uh, we already spoke about um, uh, Darendorf earlier this afternoon. Darendorf in Florence in 79 uh, gave a long speech and he said, um, Europe needs to be organized as a Europe a la carte. These are his words. He said, we have to accommodate the diverging preferences of societies, and your assumption is differing from that. You say, well, if we build trust, um, we will arrive at the same kind of preferences. Is that really uh, sufficient? Oh, well, thank you for your question. Maybe I wasn't clear. I did not mean that we need to have the same preferences. Indeed, I mentioned at some stage that different preferences are healthy. The issue is not to have the same preference about the same target. Uh, the issue is exploit diversity, by the way. Trust is about the fact that countries, cultures, governments, states with different preferences can build something together. So trust is different from having, different, from having the same preferences. And my point is simply, at least this comes most likely from my policy experience, is that trust can be, as I said, accumulated with hard work, but also can be destroyed very quickly. But also, if there is enough trust, there is a possibility to agree on common solutions, even if the starting points are very far away. So i sorry to be so optimistic about the fact that in spite of bad results, there is a chance of success. Yes, please. Uh, Anatole Kolecki of Gav Culture Economics and Project Syndicate. Uh, if I could, I would like to uh, bring you to what's going on in, in Italy, but uh, in the context very much of what you've been saying. You've been talking about the need to coordinate uh, macroeconomic stabilization and structural reform, and also the way that uh, positive structural reforms can uh, facilitate stabilization, also create trust. Now, the problem that I see it in Italy is that uh, right now with the new government is that there are two areas that uh, people are concerned about. One is the uh, potential uh, fiscal policy and, if you like, the cyclical aspects of the new government's policies. But the other is the structural changes which the two parties have agreed on. And it seems to me that these structural changes are more, should be more of a concern to the rest of Europe than the question of the uh, deficit policies. Because uh, the two parties seem to have agreed on reversing the three key structural reforms which under you and your predecessors were achieved in Italy. Uh, the pension reform, the labor market reforms, and most recently, even the recapitalization of the banking sectors. Is that uh, a, a correct analysis of what's going on in Italy, that they're actually seriously going to uh, uh, reverse these structural reforms, or am I being too pessimistic? I'm afraid you might be right. Uh, of course, the new government is only one month old and we can simply judge from statements and from initial policy decisions like the ones that were taken a few days ago. Indeed, there are three uh, themes in the policy agenda. One is the fiscal stance, and my successor uh, is taking a fiscal stance which I would much, very much subscribe myself because it, it continues consolidation, reaching the targets agreed upon with the Commission and finding space for the uh, support of growth while putting that on a declining 
path, which what, what I refer to as the Italy's narrow path policy. And that's the least of the problems. The problems come in the other part of the agenda from two sides. One is that if you add together all the promises or the items included in so-called social contract between the League and the Five Star Movement, if you uh, count the numbers to see what the total bill adds to, in no way these measures can be, can be sustained given the first point, given that you want to continue with fiscal consolidation. So this is the second part. The third part is what we are seeing in terms of labor market reform. And you, were, uh, you mentioned the fact that some of these decisions may be seen as reversing the re structural reforms introduced by previous government. Uh, indeed, this has been in the statements of the government, especially by the Minister of Labor, Mr. Mr. Di Maio, yes, I, I tend to forget his name. <laughs> uh, in terms of the point, I, I think the point is, is, is worth recalling because it has a general, a general value. It's about uh, fighting back measures that may generate uh, precarious labor conditions, temporary contracts and the like. So the idea of, that the government came out with is to put uh, stops and limitations to the introduction of uh, part-time contracts without, however, generating any incentive for unlimited time contracts, which would be the right answer. Of course, that has budget implications, uh, but that's another story. So what I am concerned about is the, that the policy of, as resulting from announcement and from uh, initial decisions, it's about undoing things that were done in the past rather than putting on the table new decisions. The only new measure that has been announced repeatedly is the so-called flat tax introduction, which has many versions. One, in any case, uh, in all the versions that were considered, it's very expensive and uh, crashes right into the budget constraint that we're facing. So uh, I'm not so happy about what's happening in my country. Maybe that's uh, clearly coming out. Yeah, thank you. Thanks a lot for this uh, presentation. I have, I have two remarks. Uh, you support the European deposit insurance. Are you not afraid that uh, the zombie banks, which uh, we do have in some uh, places in Europe, would then be able to collect funds deposits from every, everywhere and invest them in dubious activities. Think of Cyprus, for example, those casino banks which have driven the country into big trouble. Under a deposit insurance, they would be able to have uh, access to unlimited funds from all over Europe. Uh, we have two examples in history w which shows how dangerous a deposit insurance is. Uh, one is the American savings and loan crisis, where uh, the American savings banks were able to attract lots of resources and uh, invest them in dubious projects. Half of the American savings and loan banks went bankrupt uh, after that. And the second is the German Landesbanken, who under the protection of the government were also able to attract lots of funds and invest them somewhere in the world. So I think history has shown us how dangerous uh, such protection can be and we should be on the safe side and having smaller solutions. Germany does not even have a common nationwide deposit insurance. Why should we jump from our local structures to uh, a European structure? It's completely un ununderstandable. And the second is uh, risk sharing. The big theme, it's always repeated, but is it really true? Uh, if we have Keynesian shocks, you could do something with common money which is given to countries, but are they really idiosyncratic? No, the Keynesian shocks are very, very correlated in Europe. 
What is not correlated are structural changes in countries which lose their competitiveness. For example, if Germany's car industry goes under, that would be a structural change. But can you really help with giving Germany money in that case? Because money from other countries ultimately means merchandise from other countries. How can you help an economy by delivering goods from other countries? You drive this economy into a Dutch disease, and Italy, with the Mezzogiorno, is the best example of the kind of uh, mess you can create by trying to help uh, regions with structural problems uh, with monetary transfers. So I'm not at all convinced of these two essential points. It's always repeated in Europe. It doesn't make more sense. Thank you, Hans Werner. I was expecting your question, actually. <laughs> well, let me, let me answer in a very abstract way. There is the one instrument, one target issue there. In terms of banking union, banking union is not only and si simply uh, deposit insurance schemes. Indeed, there is some reason why the deposit insurance scheme pillar comes last in the sequencing of the banking union uh, project. We have had a single resolution, we have had a single supervision, now we should move towards what is missing. So my idea is not to have only the deposit insurance scheme at any level of this case, give, taking your point and uh, generalizing it. it having the, the insurance, deposit insurance scheme together with the other components of a banking union, a banking system, which have to do with resolution procedures and surveillance procedures. Now, if we want European resolution and surveillance procedures and mechanisms, which we already have, we should also have that at the deposit insurance scheme. I agree with you that in some cases it didn't work well because it generated opportunistic behavior. There are ways that can minimize that. I don't want to enter into a technical debate. So my point is simply to explain that I'm not advocating only the uh, single deposit insurance scheme. I'm advocating the completion of banking union, which has three pillars. On your second point, uh, I have in mind a situation in which first item, and I also tried to, to say that, but maybe I wasn't clear enough. The first item in the policy agenda of all countries is the structural reform agenda. So there is no way in which I can think that reforms in the labor market, which are badly needed in many countries, including Italy, would be replaced or by a demand-related short-term cyclical instrument. It's about coping with different issues. It's about coping with cyclical shocks. It's about coping with structural shocks. Again, we need both elements in an integrated Europe. And there is one element that recent history of the European economy shows that if there are shocks that generate a rise in unemployment which looks to be cyclical, if this is left uh, unaddressed for a longer time, this turns into longer term structural hysteresis and the process potential growth. So we need to have the appropriate instruments for the appropriate uh, targets. And we need a complicated uh, target uh, toolbox because we are a complicated or integrated regional economy. But there is no single, there is no silver bullet, there is no single instrument, mm -hmm. not even the ECB, mm -hmm. uh, which can uh, do it alone. Let me follow up with a question related to reform, you know, reshaping Europe. You said, first of all, investment is important in Europe and we don't have enough of it. Uh, and then you said uh, we should follow rules, but we should also be open to discussing the rules and change them if there is a consensus about changing them. So something uh, I hear, for instance, each time I meet Mario Monti, uh, or, uh, you know, also colleagues from Germany and France. Um, uh, something I hear frequently is, uh, you know, our debt rules are not very intelligent because they only look at debt and not at investment. If you, and if you look at a company, that's the analogy, uh, you wouldn't be interested in limiting debt. You would be worried if debt was growing and assets weren't growing. Uh, and that leads to the idea of an investment-based 
that rule. I'd be interested, what would you think about it? And would it be a rule, and I guess this point is very, very important, would it be a rule based on net investment? We had a rule in Germany, uh, uh, you know, when, when Mario Monti tells me, look, you had this rule in Germany about investment, I, my answer is always yes, but it was a stupid rule because it was based on gross investment. And if, you, if debt increases like gross investment, the company is swiftly bankrupt. So would, should we discuss a net, that is investment after depreciation based debt rule in Europe? Would that make sense? Before I come to this very specific question, let me state my, 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 my beliefs, which are slightly different from Mario's. First of all, of course, the key point in stabilization is bringing the debt down, and this mm -hmm. is clearly crucial in my country like in other countries. So we, we must accelerate the way, the speed at which debt goes down. Second, there is not enough investment in many European countries, I think, I believe also in Germany, and I mean both public and private. Uh, in terms of public investment, the experience in my country is that in many cases the issue is not enough, is not not enough money. Money is enough. It's about implementation, it's about rules, it's about project finance, it's about proje projects, it's about legal restrictions to re responsibilities of local administrators. Much of the public investment which is lacking in Italy is that which is not done at the municipality level mm -hmm. because the local officials are afraid of taking excessive responsibility. So we need to change those rules which are not about spending more, it's about allowing administration to spend. And so there is a big issue in Europe and in, certainly in my country about doing better with the money both public and private, but especially public in this case, about the dedication to investment. Mm -hmm. As far as the, rules, the specific rule is concerned, I, uh, I have to think about it. I'm not sure whether it's net or gross. Uh, I think that it's worth considering how to enhance public investment at the national and at the European level to provide from, for more growth in Europe. Uh, we have achieved some good results, not final results, but good results to the, what was referred to as the Juncker uh, initiative, which basically is about mobilizing public money and public agencies in Europe, but also giving them the drive to, to attract private decisions and, and risk and uh, risk taking. So I, I'm open to possibilities. I would not take uh, Mario's uh, suggestion at face value. I, sorry, I have to think about it. Mm. So I don't know a related question, question. Just, just because you're here and you can't run away. Uh, so one source of investment would be Chinese investment. You know, we, we discussed it with Sigma. Uh, so I would just be interested in your view. So should we regulate Chinese investment? Should we be worried? So that, for instance, a Chinese investor has just bought 10% of Daimler-Benz. That would be private investment. Then we have the case of the port of Piraeus. I'd just be interested, do you think we should be liberal and open and let the Chinese come in and be happy that they invest? Or should we ask the question, you know, is this in the strategic interest of Europe and should we regulate this investment? I know this is a difficult question. Well, to answer, I, I, my reaction to your difficult question is to ask another question, as usual. Economists do often do that. That's a very good strategy. Uh, yeah, no, what do we mean by investment? Do we mean technology? Do we mean pr property? Do we mean uh, shareholding or so forth? Mm -hmm. In general, let's not forget that much of the progress of Europe in the past has been obtained by attracting investment from other parts of the world. So in general, having more investment, especially long term or uh, greenfield or green root investment is good because it enhances potential growth, which is what we need in Europe. This carries along the technology because mm -hmm. your uh, investment uh, as a technology in built. It has, it has to be confronted with uh, competition law. It has to be confronted with mm -hmm. What is strategic? I left this yeah. as last because this is a very delicate issue. There is a discussion in many European countries about whether or not there should be protection of strategic assets. And in some cases it's easier to identify them, in some it's not. Mm -hmm. This is a blurred region, but I mm -hmm. think we should, we haven't thought of, I haven't thought about it enough, mm -hmm. but I think this is an, an issue that's worth considering. Mm -hmm. Also because you're, we're talking about China, which is a, market economy which is strongly state controlled and politically mm -hmm. controlled. So it's not just investment com coming yeah. from any yeah. country X.
Yeah. So it has, by definition, some strategic global implications. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have time for one more question or comment. If there's there one. is, Mr. Jungen. Uh, Mr. Minister, I listened very much um, to your talk and we met before in several other occasions. So, if we look on uh, this debate in Europe using, uh, talking about the common deposits insurance scheme, the backstop and legacy assets, the rainy day stabilization fund, the structural or external shocks to be coped with. Um, what I'm missing in this whole debate is, and would that not be a much more important issue, that the lack of innovation pace in Europe would be addressed by the gov local governments, central governments, and the European government, Eurozone, or the Commission. That is, in, particu in particular, if you see the development, we talked about China, in the US and in China, and where you, you know, Europe is losing in innovation pace. And that is true for new startups, number declining for the last more than 20 years. Very low numbers in angel investment, uh, venture capital, and this. And that is an increasing gap between Europe and the US on the one side and Europe and China on the other side. Would it not be much more important for the future of Europe to put this into the focus of what governments are trying to achieve on the European level? I tried to suggest that my answer would be definitely yes. Uh, indeed, uh, I believe, but there are many the people here in this room that are much more expert than I am in those issues, that number one, uh, we have to exploit the new technologies which offer opportunities, but also uh, issues, problems, also from a social point of view. And this is not, in the given political context and social context, this is not a marginal issue. Second, we must, I think, the, the innovation-related, the ACT-related, the digital-related issues are need also, my defi by definition, a continental approach rather than a national approach, uh, which means several different issue areas, because we all know that innovation is a complicated process which needs uh, digital, needs service integration, needs finance, needs human capital. And, uh, Many times in the past, when I simply alluded to this issue, I suggested that we should have the idea of an innovation union, meaning the integration of several segments or layers of the single market that interact together to have a truly European dimension. This, of course, is a huge task, but I think that if we are in the reshaping Europe mood, and we have hopefully secured threats from other sources of uh, instability, including the financial, then we should dedicate all our, all our efforts to better exploiting innovation. Otherwise, productivity will continue to decline. And this is not the basis for offering better opportunities, including social protection to our kids and to our children in the future. We have come to the end of this session. First of all, I would like to thank you very much, Pierre Carlo, for being here, for coming here and you know, telling us about um, European Monetary Union and all these instruments and about Italy, although I have to say I'm proud we uh, didn't spend very much time. Uh, you summarized it so clearly that everybody's happy. So thank you very much. Thanks to all of you for being here. We now have a coffee break of 30 minutes and the next panel then will address something we have addressed here, namely what is the world uh, uh, and what is the EU in this world, um, so the look uh, to the outside. Uh, so please be here at 3 o'clock, but now enjoy the coffee break. Thank you, Thank Pierre you. Carlo.